If you have cations stuck together kind of randomly or in a regular clusters, we call this a stack cluster. For bacilli, it's a little less complicated. There's not nearly as many different arrangements. Again, if we have one bacilli by itself, this is singular or just a bacilli. Bacillus. If you have two bacilli stuck together end to end, we call this a diplo bacilli. And if you have a bunch of them stuck end to end, we call this strep. And occasionally you can get them stuck together side by side. This is known as palisades. For spirulia, it's even less complicated. Most of the time, these guys are going to be singular. But occasionally, you can get chains of Spirulia, and this is Strepto. Now, I can tell you right now, most students hate this. And they hate having to find it on the microscope. The reason for that is, is one of the first things you do when you are preparing a slide, is you mix the shit out of your bacteria. And when you do that, you tend to break all these up, all right? So it can be a little hard to find out or figure out uh, at least initially. So what I like to tell my students is that when you're looking under the microscope, you're not looking for the majority. You're looking for the rarest event. Okay? So let's say I have tetrads. Right? I mix the shit out of them so that everyone's pretty much singular. So when I look, I look real hard and I find one lupin that looks like this. What would you assume from seeing that? Tetrads and I just mix them <coughs> apart. Right? Why would you assume that? Because what is the likelihood that by you mixing the shit out of them, they just randomly, magically form a perfect square? Very, very unlikely. What's more likely is you just mix them too hard and now they're all single. So you're looking for the rarest event, not necessarily the most abundant. Okay? Now it's a little weird, but you'll get the hang of it. This is how your book describes that. I have no idea what the hell that is. It looks like crap, and that's why it's all on the floor. So, classification. How do we classify prokaryotes? So classification is how we determine how related organisms are to each other. Okay? We do this in science so that we can understand who's related to who, who evolved from whom, and then we can kind of make inferences about them. Right? If we have a bacteria, we don't know anything about it, but we know it's related to this really deadly pathogenic bacteria, well, maybe this could be a pathogen too, okay? So this is important to do so that we can get a good idea of what bacteria, or what type of bacteria we're dealing with. Now, historically, this was done by looking at phenotypic traits. And what that means is physically looking at it. This makes a lot of sense when we're talking about animals, right? If you have an animal that has stripes on it, like a zebra, you can say, okay, that is different than a horse, so it's a different species. Also, if you have a male and a female zebra and they mate, that tells you right away that they are of the same species. Bacteria is a lot harder. You look under the microscope and they all just look like blobs. And they don't mate with each other. They just divide. Binary fission on their own. So it can be a lot more difficult to classify prokaryotes compared to other uh, higher organisms. So how do we do it? Well, back in the day, we used to do it by what do they look like, what do they produce, what type of enzymes do they have, what's their cell wall made out of, all that kind of stuff. Okay? And that can only get us so far because there are a lot of different types of bacteria out there. So nowadays, what we do instead is we sequence. We take out the DNA or the RNA, we put it into a sequencer, which tells us all the DNA and RNA contents, and then we can compare. 
If we take an organism, let's say E. coli, and I sequence it, and then I take my unknown <laughs> organism and I sequence it, and then I compare the two. If my unknown is 99% the same as E. coli, chances are it came from E. coli, or it's a close relative to E. coli. Much like Mars, right? DNA sequence is the same, they're related. However, if it's only 20% the same, then chances are it's not related and it's some distant relative from a long, long time ago. Okay? Once we do this, we can come up with species. Species is basically an organism that is very, very similar to its cells. We just shot them because they are cells. Now, when we have a bunch of species and they're related to each other, we then uh, often say they're from the same genus which essentially means they are close relatives. And a lot of times when we talk about organisms, especially with scientific names, we talk about them as their genus and their species. Genus denotes what group they're from of related organisms, where species tells you about that particular organism itself. Okay, or where it belongs. So an example would be E. coli. E stands for Astralia, which is its genus, Coli is its species. Okay. What's interesting about bacteria and prokaryotes in general is that they evolve very, very, very quickly. Which means in a matter of months, they can change their genetic material in such a way that they no longer act like a normal organism from that species. However, their DNA is still very similar. So we don't want to call them a new species. Instead, we call them a subspecies. This means they're very, very, very similar, at least genetically. However, there's some differences that make them different. Okay? An example would be E. coli. So E. coli is a normal commensal found in all mammalian guts, including ours. We all have it. It's healthy. However, there are some versions or subspecies of E. coli that can become pathogenic. An example is E. coli 0157A. That subspecies in particular can cause diarrhea and in about 10% of people, kidney failure and death unless they get a new kidney. So, same species, 99.9% .9 the same when you look at them, but there's a couple key differences that make it now pathogenic. So we have to talk about subspecies when we talk about bacteria because these very small little differences can make a big difference. And last but not least, the archaea. I told you we would talk about them. These are close relatives to bacteria. They are also prokaryotes. However, they are not pathogenic. Instead, they are found in the environment, often in very nasty and hospitable places. So here in this example, we've got the Great Salt Lake. You see a lot of salt, a little briny water, and all this brown floaty stuff are archaea. Okay? Not harmful to us. They live in bad, nasty places. So that's all we're going to give them because they're not pathogenic. Any questions in chapter four? All right. I'll see you guys on Thursday.